The Milwaukee Brewers were in Phoenix playing the Diamondbacks. And um, football fandom runs deeper in my family than baseball fandom does. But my dad and my sister and I are all from originally from Milwaukee. So we figured it'd be fun to go spend an afternoon at the ballpark on Sunday, uh, watching the game and stuffing our faces with the typical ballpark fare, hot dogs, popcorn, peanuts. Uh, we actually sat in the all-you-can-eat section at Chase Field in Phoenix. So we basically had an unlimited supply of those things at our disposal. Uh, between the bites of the four hot dogs, two helpings of peanuts, a bag of chips, four bottles of water, one lemonade, and a beer that I put away over six and a half innings. That may be impressive, or you may be thinking you were in El Tucnitzis and you only ate four hot dogs. I don't know. I, I was full. Um, I felt like it was a lot. So during while eating all that, I would occasionally look up and catch a pitch or two out on the field. And I'm always impressed by the athleticism on display at a professional sporting event. I mean, these guys are the best of the best, right? These are the small fraction of people in the world who have the gifts and talents to play baseball for a living. There are uh, three, uh, 30 Major League Baseball teams. Each team has an active roster of 25 players. So that's 750 people in the entirety of Major League Baseball. Even if we included the expanded rosters, which is 40 players per team, we're looking at 1,200 players total. That's 0.000034% of the population of America that's playing professional baseball, all of which who could beat me up with no effort at all. Um, and when, yes, there are varying degrees of talent between those 1,200 players. But what's crazy to me is that we as a society are constantly comparing and contrasting these guys to figure out who is better and who is the best. And this just doesn't happen with baseball either. It's all professional sports. NFL Network is currently spending a few hours every Sunday night this summer counting down who they think are the top 100 players in the NFL currently. And I think this time of year, it's actually most prevalent, or I'm hearing most in basketball. The NBA Finals just wrapped up, and the talk this time of year is always whether or not LeBron James is the greatest player to ever play the game and or if he's better than Michael Jordan. Uh, and people were asking the same thing, questions about Kobe Bryant when Kobe was still playing. I'm sure they were comparing Michael Jordan to somebody back when he was still playing too. Now, I'm not a hugely athletic or competitive guy. I'm sure that comes as a massive shock to any of you. Um, but it still begs the question to me, why can't we just be okay to be one of the very few people who have such a rare talent? Why do we always have to constantly compare and try and figure out who's the best? Different players play in different eras, and there are different rules and different advancements in sports technology and training methods that we'll never see Jordan in his prime play LeBron James in his prime. It won't happen. So there's never any way to prove who, will truly, who truly is the best. While we have a lot of loud people on ESPN debating this kind of stuff 24 hours a day, it isn't something that is truly unique to our time. There's something in our human nature that makes us want to compare everything. And we want to be on the right side of the comparison. Whoever our guy is, say I'm a Jordan guy, I am a Jordan guy. Um, I, I want him to be the best. And I want to be the right side on the argument. I want my guy to be the best. But how do we treat God when it comes to the best of lists of our own lives? Do we prioritize him over the other great things in our life? Do we treat him as the best of the best over all the other gods, with the lowercase g, that we let into our lives, our stuff, our work, our money? Do we allow God to prove that he is worthy of our trust and our devotion? Today we are continuing our three-week look at Gideon, uh, one of the many unlikely people that God time and time again calls to serve him. In the passage we're going to go through this morning, Gideon finds himself caught up in what I would call maybe an Old Testament equivalent of this best of debate. Gideon even asked God to prove himself multiple times to make sure God is who he says he is. As you may remember from Andrew's message last week, Gideon was the fifth judge of Israel. He was a military leader and a prophet. When God called him, he called him mighty hero. Gideon was unsure of God's calling and unsure he was the one to defeat the Midianites. That was what God was calling him to do. But as he so often does with us, God saw past Gideon's own insecurities and called him up to the challenge. 
and called him to the challenge ahead by giving him the identity he knew Gideon was capable of, mighty hero. God spoke to Gideon through an angel. Despite Gideon's insecurity uh, that, was, that he was not the man for the job, God's angel reassured him that God would be with him and protect him, and he would prevail over the Midianites. When we pick up our story, we see the first of three times Gideon asked God for a sign or a proof that God is really who he says he is, and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. So in Judges, Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that, this, that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat, and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then, carrying the meat in a basket and broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel, who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of his staff in his hand and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah, in the land of the clan Abizar to this day. I honestly don't blame Gideon for one bit for being skeptical that this was truly the uh, angel of the Lord. If Gideon was anything like me, he probably thought, and eh, this thing doesn't really, this type of thing doesn't really happen all that often. Angels don't appear all that often. And when they don't, they, it doesn't happen to people like me, right? And that's what I'd be thinking in the situation. And that's kind of what I think when I, I'm typically more of a skeptical person when you hear stories about people having visions or more supernatural experiences with God. Um, I'm a little more skeptical. And so I, that's the way I think. Um, but I have a story. So you all know my lovely wife, Erica, up here. Um, a lot of you may not know our story together. We were really good friends for almost four years before we even started dating. Um, and the majority of that time, there was no more romantic interest between us at all. We were just friends. That's really all it was. We hung out all the time, but we were just friends. But a year and a half before we became a couple, um, I was sitting in my apartment one day uh, alone. My roommate was in class and we lived in like this fourplex house and we were the only ones living in any of the four apartments in it. So there was literally nobody else around. And so this particular afternoon, I was doing the good Christian thing, and I was spending some time reading my Bible and praying. In a small period of silence while I was praying, I heard, kid you not, as clear as day, in a voice I did not recognize the words out loud, you will marry Erica. Totally freaked me out. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> Um, I, I had, and I still have no other explanation that that was the voice of God revealing a part of my future to me. Why he chose to do so in that particular moment, I don't know. I still don't know. I may never know. My reaction in the moment was to dis dismiss it, honestly, to shrug it off and convince myself that it wasn't real. I didn't think to offer something to God to help confirm what he had said or to confirm that it was him who said it. Maybe I should have taken a play out of Gideon's playbook and not necessarily made a meal as an offering, but offer more of my time, more of my prayer to discern what this meant and what God wanted me to do with this information at that time in my life. Instead, I did my best to ignore it and push it out of my head, but it was always still back there a little bit. Perhaps I could have been more like Gideon and sought God's confirmation and saved myself a couple bad relationships that happened between that moment and then the moment Eric and I got together. But it did ultimately all work out anyway, so I can't be too mad. Um, but when Gideon gets the confirmation that this is, is indeed the Lord speaking to him, his reaction isn't relief, it isn't joy, it's fear. Fear for his life and his well-being. He doesn't fear God, he fears his own people because they have been worshiping the false god Baal. 
Even his own father has built an altar to Baal. But God has a plan to prove himself to Gideon's people, to prove himself mightier than any false god. The first big task that God asked of Gideon was to overthrow the altar of Baal that the people of Israel had erected. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid the other members of his father's household, and he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Gideon knew that tearing down this altar of Baal would make the people of Israel mad. But he did what God asked anyways, albeit under the cover of darkness with 10 other dudes helping him and protecting him. But he did it anyways. And he did it, did it so nobody would see him. He did it at night. And that probably wasn't a bad move. But does God scold Gideon for his fear or lack of faith? Not at all. God knows Gideon, and you and me for that matter, better than we know ourselves. Fear in, in times of uncertainty or in the face of seemingly tall tasks is only human nature. I think God knows that and doesn't necessarily expect perfection from us. Yet Gideon ultimately does not allow his fear to prevent him from being obedient to God, and neither should we. It's easier said than done, I know. But if we allow him to, God takes us and teaches us step by step when we are obedient to him and trust in him. And this was one of the many steps God led Gideon to. But despite his obedience, the many of Israel still find out that it was Gideon that destroyed the altar. The men were upset and wanted Gideon to be handed over to them so, they, so he could be killed on the behalf of Baal. Early the next morning, as people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? After asking around and making a careful search, they learned it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Gideon, now almost assuredly more fearful than ever for his security and for his life, finds an ally in an unlikely place. But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal is truly a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke his altar. From then, Gideon was called Jerob Baal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. Joash, Gideon's father, surprisingly comes to his defense. That was his father's altar to Baal. You would have think he might have been one of the most upset about it being destroyed. But he had a bit of miraculous change of heart, a change of heart that I can imagine could only come from the grace of God himself. Joash says that if Baal hadn't been, had been a true God, he could kill Gideon himself. Needless to say, Gideon is not killed. This is a beautiful picture to me of God's promise to Gideon that he would protect him and protect his life, a father standing up for his son, potentially putting himself in harm's way, willing to sacrifice himself for his child. Joash had to know that standing up to the men of Israel that were upset could go south on him real quick, but he did it anyways. And God kept Gideon and Joash safe proving to each of them that he was the greatest God, the one true God, and at the top of that best of God's list without a close second. So now that Gideon has obeyed God and destroyed the altar of Baal, it was time for him to follow God's next step by gathering men to go to war with the Midianites. Gideon calls on men from the surrounding areas to build his army. Soon, after the armies, soon afterwards, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power, 
he blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abizar came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning the warriors, and all of them responded. If I had been Gideon, I would have been worried with this threat growing closer that no one would respond to my message for help. But that was not the case. God provided the army he had promised Gideon. Yet even after God confirmed himself to Gideon on this occasion, and he had already confirmed himself to Gideon on two other occasions, Gideon is still overcome with uncertainty and doubt. And he asked God for proof that his plan is really for him to go fight the Midianites. Then Gideon said to God, if you're truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up the next morning, he squeezed the fleece out and wrung out a whole bowl of water. Apparently, the phrase putting out a fleece is like a thing. Like, I, when doing my research, like, people, all this stuff that I was reading was like, well, you've heard the phrase, you're putting out a fleece. I'm like, no, I mean, I've read the story before. But I've never heard anybody say putting out a fleece. So apparently, that's something people say when they're trying to uh, figure out or confirm if something is going to happen or not. I've never heard it. Maybe you have. Um, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Regardless... I kind of want you to think about how you would might respond to the request that Gideon was making. I kind of picture God under his breath going, seriously, dude, all the things we've already been through, it's not enough. Fine, I'll give you another sign. Um, at least that's how I would respond. But thankfully for all of us, I am not God and God is much more gracious than I am. And he is much more gracious in his response in confirming what is being asked of Gideon. God responds by doing exactly what Gideon asks. But here's the kicker. Still not enough for Gideon. He asks for another sign. Again, I picture God going, really, dude? Come on. The Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. I'm gonna be honest, I kind of struggle with this part of the scripture this morning a little bit because it sure seems like Gideon is testing God. Deuteronomy 6.16 6, says, do not put the Lord to test. And Jesus quoted this very scripture when he was being tempted by Satan in the desert. Then the devil looked, at the, looked to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responds, the scriptures also say, you must not, put, you must not test the Lord your God. So there's that, don't test the Lord. Then on the flip side, the Bible also says, when talking about the blessings tithing can bring to us, God says, bring all the tithes in the storehouses so that there will be enough food in the temple if you do. I will open up the windows for, of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So we have don't test me and then test me. But I don't think necessarily what Gideon is doing here really falls into either of those categories of testing or not testing God. So if you feel like God is asking you to do something, you're probably going to have some questions about it. At least you're going to want some clarification or extra confirmation on it, especially if that thing he is asking you to do is difficult. Gideon no longer doubted God, or he didn't test God because he wasn't sure of God's power or authority. He, was ask, he asked God to test the plan, the action he was asking Gideon to take. And there, to me, lies the difference between these tests and then the two scripture passages that I just read on testing God. He no longer, he's no longer questioning God's power or whether or not he's the best of the best. 
He just wants to confirm the steps and the plans he knew God was asking him to walk towards. We all have doubts at some point or another. As long as we focus those doubts back towards God, he not only wants to answer them, but he wants to convert those doubts into a stronger faith in him. God is incredibly patient and gracious with us, so much more so than we are with others and even ourselves. I think Gideon feared he was treading on dangerous ground and potentially trying God's patience when he made the second request for a sign. But God treated Gideon with patience, mercy, love, and obliged his request. But we have to be careful that our main takeaway from this story um, is not, let's ask God for a sign every time we're trying to figure out what we're trying to do. Yes, God is powerful enough to do so. He's the best of the best. But, he's ask, but asking for signs usually stems from our own insecurity and uncertainty with what he's, we're being asked to do. Even if God were get, to give us the sign we asked for, it may not give us what we crave because we're still shackled with that doubt. That often leads to asking for multiple signs. And whether or not God provides any of them, that ends up being irrelevant because we're looking for what we want to see, not for what God wants to show us. Rather than seeking fleeces and signs for confirmation, we can seek God in prayer by studying his words in the Bible, and we can even seek counsel of uh, other followers of Jesus for wise counsel. Gideon's story and countless other stories in the Bible show us that God is indeed powerful enough to give us the miraculous signs that we might be tempted to ask him for. But he more greatly desires us putting our faith in him and trust that he will guide us step by step wherever he is asking us to go and whatever he's asking us to do. So I could scream from a mountaintop that I think Michael Jordan is and will always be the greatest basketball player to play the game, better than LeBron James, but we'll never have definitive proof of that. It's always going to be a matter of debate and there's going to succumb somebody else after LeBron James that they're going to compare to him and so on and so forth. But Gideon's story is proof to us that God is greater than Baal greater than the faith we put in our things, in our job, in our money, or any number of things we prioritize God, over God any given day. Let's be people who learn from Gideon, but don't act like him. Let's take comfort in the faith we put in God and the reassurances that God will guide us step by step along whatever path he has sent us down. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you um, for the stories you give us in the Bible the scripture, the things we can learn from them, Lord. Thank you for Gideon's story um, and that he shows us um, how powerful you are and uh, how gracious and patient you are with us when we're facing times of uncertainty or um, doubt or fear in any given situation um, in our lives. We ask that we be open to the things that you're asking us to do, however small or big they are, and that we may have the faith and the trust in you that, that you will hold us near to you. And then that's all that matters. And that we just need to take that first step in doing those things. Um, and that you'll guide us with every subsequent step. Pray this all in your name. Amen.